family tragedy leads to a difficult case in 25 minutes on BBC One when Amanda Burton stars in Silent Witness. When there's no more room in hell, the dead shall walk the earth. It gets up and kills. The people it kills get up and kill. This Sunday at 11.30, we bring you George Romero's classic, Dawn of the Dead, part of the forbidden season on BBC Two. Scary, isn't it? Mathematics is tremendously difficult to understand. But if your calculations are right, you can predict the future. Stocks and shares need never be a risky business. You can beat the casinos at their own game, and the bookies could tip the odds in your favour. I laid out £432 in the bet, and I won £150,000. Take a gamble on math. If you can predict it, the future's bright. The numbers game starts tomorrow, 7.30 BBC Two. New York's Silicon Alley is the destination in 45 minutes to meet the new media talent which is revolutionizing the net. You're watching BBC Two with the Monday Newsnight. The eyes to the right, 272. The nose to the left, 273. <laughs> Defeat for the government in the Commons. Only hours after John Major tells his cabinet to soldier on to the very end. If they can't win a vote on the core issue of education, how can they stagger on till May? Opposition parties staged a successful ambush in the House of Commons early this evening, defeating the government by one vote on a clause that would have allowed grant-maintained schools to increase their capacity by more than 50%. So will votes like these upset the Prime Minister's determination to go to the polls on May Day, as he said today? We'll put all this to the Welsh Secretary and two of his leading opponents, Donald Dewar, Labour's Chief Whip, and the Liberal Democrats' Deputy Leader. And as ministers took to briefing in the local pub after their Chequers Manifesto summit, what election line will the Tories take? Also tonight, as government throws cash and effort at a new media campaign to curb rising sectarianism in Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Secretary says comparisons with escalating tension in Germany in the 30s are not overstated. Why do you resign, sir? Oh, I don't really want to say anything for a while till, uh, till I'm uh, able to talk about the future. And Michael Grade quits Channel 4 when he could have hung on to one of the best paid jobs in television for years. Is it the new threat from Channel 5 or fear that the government will privatise his channel? But first, politics is a sign of things to come. Fifty Conservatives, including five Cabinet Ministers, failed to make it to the Commons to vote through a clause in their schools bill earlier this evening. And the opposition pounced. Here's Mark Mardell. Thanks, Peter. There won't be a vote of confidence. The government won't fall. But Labour has inflicted a defeat, reminding the government of its vulnerability, indeed, of its mortality. Just as the message was coming out of a special Cabinet meeting that the Prime Minister doesn't want an early election, he plans to carry on governing for a few months yet. <laughs> An informal John Major welcomed his ministers to his country home. He didn't, in fact, mention the election date to the full meeting. It wasn't discussed, but the line the spin doctors were pumping out was that John Major had once again made it clear he was playing it long until May the 1st. After tonight, it might look like prolonging the agony. The eyes to the right, 272. The nose to the left, 273. <laughs> the amendment, defeated by a single vote, was about allowing grant-maintained schools to take more pupils. This part of the bill had already been defeated in committee. This time, the failure to vote by five cabinet ministers, among others, contributed to a defeat that's raised temperatures at Westminster. Votes in the Commons have been more tense, with the sick taken in by ambulances for big votes, since Labour ended the arrangements whereby each side pairs ill or otherwise occupied MPs so that the actual voting numbers are not affected by predictable absences. The opposition has been waiting for just such an ambush. Amazing. 
This morning at Chequers, he was talking about May the 1st as the next general election. By the evening, he can't even deliver the vote for his education bill. Government's in complete disarray. We don't want to wait till May the 1st. We want this election as soon as possible. If tonight's defeat stands, Grant maintains schools will have lost the opportunity to expand by 50% without asking permission from the government. While Labour will take it as a simple humiliation of the Cabinet, some are concerned that the policy will be missed. Well, I'm disappointed, but that's nothing compared with the disappointment that will be felt by the thousands of children who won't be able to get into the schools of their choice. Uh, there is huge demand for places in grant-maintained schools compared with local authority schools, and this means that those schools will not be able to expand to meet parental wishes. So uh, I don't have a, an immediate and in irreconcilable... Ironically, one of the themes the Tories have been gambling on today was expanding parental choice in education. After the Cabinet's special meeting, Stephen Dorrell was dispatched to brief the waiting media in a nearby pub. Nothing particularly fresh has been unveiled as yet. Even the Prime Minister's desire for a May election is mere repetition. Cabinet ministers don't seem to be putting any money on it. When do you think the election will be? Uh, that's for the Prime Minister to decide. Well, well, you've been with the Prime Minister today. Well, what impression do you get? Well, he has made clear his desire to carry out a full five-year mandate. Uh, and uh, we're planning on that basis, but with the possibility that it may come earlier. Well, the line from the pub is that the Tory manifesto will be a reforming agenda for the hard-working classes. The details will come out in news conferences over the next few weeks. But after tonight's vote, Labour must be hoping that Mr Major won't be able to hit his desired target date and that they'll be able to call time on the government. Well, now, uh, Mark, does this make an election more likely? I suppose a, a very li little bit more likely, but in fact, governments can have their legislative programme ripped to shreds and still carry on. The last Labour government lost 46 votes, 26 of those are about really important legislation. So they can carry on looking a bit more frayed at the edges. The only thing they can't do is lose a confidence vote, and the reason Labour aren't going to put one of those down is because the Ulster Unionists aren't going to vote with them. There's no sign that the Ulster Unionists are getting particularly fed up with the government, unless they do. Yes, it can go on till May. But now, how um, unwise does this make Mr Major look on a day that he loses a vote in the Commons in making it clear to his cabinet he wants to go, not, as early, not before May the 1st? I suppose what he thinks he's doing is that he's, he's closing down people continually debating the, the date of the election, or he'd like to do that. And also he's trying to say that I've got a full programme of government, I want to carry on, and there's plenty of things that I, I want to do. But yes, certainly that, that is true. It ties his hands to a certain extent. If he is forced to change his mind, or simply wants to change his mind, it makes him look a little bit silly for having gone on so often about May. Mark, thank you very much. I'm joined now by Donald Dewar, who is Labour's chief whip, by Anne Beef, deputy leader of the Liberal Democrats, and William Hague, the Welsh Secretary. Uh, you, you were at Chequers, were you, Mr Hague? Yes, I was, and we had a very good meeting. Yeah, but now it all looks a bit odd and awkward, doesn't it, with the defeat in the Commons tonight, talking of the 1st of May? Well, actually, we didn't discuss the election date at all, as Mark Mondell pointed out in his report at the meeting today. And there's no... No, but let's just be quite clear about this. I mean, the, the, the message is coming out, isn't it, that you would like to wait, if you can, until the 1st of May, right? No, I think the message is that is an option, but the Prime Minister certainly hasn't committed himself to any particular date. Uh, he retains the option to have an election at any time in the next three or four months. I suppose it looks a little less likely that he'll uh, want to keep that option open after what happened tonight. He may have to go very early. No, th this, w this was uh, an interesting vote, but it certainly isn't something that brings the Parliament to an end. Again, Mark Mardell has just pointed out that the last Labour government had defeats in Parliament hand over fist. Uh, it is an irritating thing. It's an incredibly hypocritical thing on the part of the Labour Party to vote against the expansion of grant maintained schools when several of their leaders send their children to grant maintained schools. So they want grant maintained schools for themselves, but not for anybody else. Incredibly hypocritical. Uh, and it's something we will seek to reverse in the House of Lords. It doesn't bring the Parliament to an end. Mr. Dewar, in the light of uh, what Mr. Hager just said, how do you explain your vote against this clause tonight? We opposed it in committee, and we defeated them in committee, and we defeated them again when they tried to put it back in at report stage. So I think it'll be quite difficult for their lordships in the upper house um, uh, to defy the House of Commons in this matter. And let me make it clear, yes, what it has done is stop to grant maintain schools taking the power to expand, expand at will, irrespective of what may be happening in the educational system, and without having any authority for doing so from the Secretary but of State. But as Mr Hague so says, the very grant maintain schools are the choice of uh, Ms Harmon and Mr Blair. Well, what I'm saying to you is that we've always maintained, and always will maintain, that there has got to be an element of planning, there has got to be an overall structure through education. 
which uh, guarantees parental choice. And uh, what we are trying to do here is to stop them being put in the privileged position of being able to expand uh, and uh, eat resources in the, in the, in the process uh, without having any recourse um, uh, to educational planning or to the Secretary of State. So that is a very simple, straightforward. The important thing is the morale here um, uh, that the government is clearly seen, to quote your own headlines, as staggering on. I don't think government should stagger on. I think that they ought to now to have the courage to go to the country and well, ask for a mandate. what about you uh, having the courage, as you put it, to uh, call a vote of confidence? Well, we're not going to put down a vote of confidence until we know that we can, um, in fact, carry it. And as uh, you have been marking on your programme, at the moment, the Ulster Unions are prepared to prop up the government. They have a rather different agenda from other parties. I make no complaint about that. But uh, there is no doubt at all that uh, that is what is buttressing. I think the Prime Minister himself used the word they were hanging on. I, I mean, it can't be in the national interest to have a government that is just hanging on. Mr Beath, do, do, um, do you agree with uh, 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 Mr Dewar that this is an undesirable part of this bill? And why did you vote against it? Well, what indeed the majority of people want to know is how they're going to get resources for the schools that the majority of children go to and the expansion at will of direct <coughs> grant schools. Something incidentally which the present Secretary of State for Education, using her existing powers, has refused to allow on a number of occasions makes it impossible for local authorities to plan adequate educational provision for the majority of children in their area. The arguments were rehearsed in committee, the government lost, now they've lost again. Now it's not a bad thing that governments lose when they've got things wrong, but if they're going to keep on losing in this way, there's no way they can present themselves as a great decisive government of ideas. There's no way they're going to seek consensus, so they're not going to present a, a very good picture to Mr. the Mr Hay, can this bill get through now? Well, the yes, bill, of, course the, uh, of course the bill can get through. This was on one amendment or one new clause to the bill. And as I say, we'll seek to reverse that uh, anyway. And th this issue, though, does illustrate one of the issues that we will have in the election. But We're seeking to extend and expand choice so that schools that are popular can expand. Donald Dewar is saying he wants to plan for people instead. I know which they'd rather have, their own choice rather than Labour politicians on, you, thinking you, they can you, plan you, you, their education But, Mr Haig, you've just been defeated on a core clause in this bill, haven't you? Can you really stand there, sit there, and say that you have a credible education policy now, that this bill can actually get through? Yes, of course, yes, there's, no, there's no question of the bill not getting through. Uh, this was on one amendment well, to the bill, as I said, and it's, the, Dewar, it's an amendment which we will seek to reverse. The bill has got uh, uh, now an enormous gap in it. There are all sorts of clauses present in the bill which depend upon the clause that has been removed. And I think the government's in a very, very difficult situation. Do you want to kill and the bill? To, we, want to, kill we want to get bits of it removed, the bits ah. that are wrong, because we want to preserve choice. We want to make sure that choice is for everyone and not for a few. And above all, we have listened week after week to the government saying in the House of Lords, you can't overturn us because we represent a decision that has been taken by the elected House of Commons. We've got two decisions on this clause from the elected House of Commons. And I do not think that it is right, in fact, um, to assume that the House of Lords will simply um, uh, lie down to the government's insistence. Mr. Beath, do you want to, um, to, to frustrate parts of this bill or the whole of it? Only, only parts of this bill. But what is going to matter to most people is not uh, a choice which doesn't apply to them, which is not available to them, but what's going to happen in the schools that their own children go to. And for that to be changed, you need resources. And for that, I think we need a general election so that people can actually vote for change in that area. And uh, for the Prime Minister to announce on the, the very day that he sustains this defeat that he's going to be able to hold on May the 1st suggests that he's getting out of touch with the real world. Yeah, yeah. But Mr. Hay, just finally, you, there have been 35 by-elections since you won your own by-election in Richmond back in 1989, and the, your party hasn't won one of those by-elections. Now, you're talking about wanting to see a general election way off in May when the Wirral South by-election is coming up in the next four weeks. Do you really want to fight that by-election on its own? Why not have a general election now and have done with it? <laughs> well, first of all, as I say, we haven't committed ourselves to any election date. Secondly, I well know, because you've just pointed out I won a by-election for the government eight years ago, that it is possible to win a by-election <laughs> for the governing party. And I think people may be in for a great surprise if and when we hold that uh, particular by-election. Thirdly, may I just say all this stuff about hanging on uh, is just the ritual stuff of opposition parties. If governments don't have an election till the end of a parliament, they say the government's hanging on. If they have an election before that, they say the government's running scared and has decided it has to have an election before things get worse. You could take these things out of a phrase book for the pre-election period of any parliament of the last 50 uh, years. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we'll come back to you, Mr. Hague, in a moment, because uh, 
The government uh, may have faced the opposition in Parliament, but how do they expect, how does Mr Haig expect to face up to the voters who appear to be showing, uh, who appear to be showing less inclined than at any time in two decades to accept another Tory government? So we went to Worcester, home of the mythical Worcester woman, who Tory election strategists have identified as the successor to Basildon Man. He was the one, Basildon Man, who was supposed to have kept the Conservatives in power in the 1980s and the early 1990s. She, Worcester woman, the strategists believe, will decide John Major's fate in 1997. Now, Worcester is a marginal seat that the Tories must hold if they're to stop Labour winning power. Four of Worcester's floating voters gave us their view of the Conservative policies that they'd like to see. I'm a floating voter, and if I'm going to vote Conservative next time, they've got to do two things. First of all, they've got to declare a long-term commitment to proper funding for education and remove the inequities of funding between counties. If my school were taken to Bedfordshire, I'd get something like a quarter of a million pounds more than I do now. And the other thing that they would have to do, which is most unlikely, is that they're going to have to take away the funding for private education in the form of assisted places. I voted for the Conservatives at the last election but I think it's unlikely that I'll vote for them at the next one. There are two issues particularly that worry me. The one is the environment, and the other is violent crime. In 1996, we suffered the Dunblane massacre, and also we see growing use of drugs and a sense of hopelessness in teenagers. And I'm worried that my children are growing up in a very violent place. I've been in the West Midlands for most of my life, and for most of my life I've voted Conservative. But this time, for this election, I'm in great doubt. And I'll tell you why. The Conservatives have consistently ignored the senior generation, the generation of those of us who are over 50. And we constitute one third of the electorate. For instance, they have not reformed the pension situation, which is still tied to RPI instead of earnings, and they have taken no steps at all to eliminate and legislate against age discrimination. And this is an area that worries me tremendously. If they want my vote and the vote of many of my contemporaries, they will have to address these two areas very, very clearly. Once upon a time, I voted Conservative. It's very unlikely I'll do it again. Two main reasons concerned with education. The first one, is that funding must be made equally available to all schools around the country so that every child has the same chance of getting to university. Once they've finally secured their place and studied for their degree, they need, when they leave, not to have a yoke of debt around their neck. The grant situation must be restructured. Well, that was uh, four voices from the city of Worcester a vital seat for the Tories to hold on to, Mr. Haig's party to hold on to at the general election coming up, whenever it does come up, Mr. Haig. Now, what can you tell those voters, first of all, in broad terms, about the nature of your manifesto? What new, what reassurance uh, is it going to offer them? Well, what we want to do is to continue with the successful change that we've brought to this country over some years now. Uh, we got rid of the British disease, as it was called, in the 1980s. Uh, we want to continue to expand choice and opportunity and ownership for people in the 1990s. But now, the top, top seem, of the list... You, you don't seem to have persuaded many voters uh, that you've succeeded in carrying all these things out. Well, I think we're persuading more and more voters, and of course this is what the election campaign will be for, uh, to persuade the voters and to show them that what we're doing is in the interest of the country and very much in their interest. Top of our list is jobs. Uh, we now have created a fantastic job creation machine in this country. A million fall in unemployment over the last five years, whereas it's rising in most of the other European countries. It's a phenomenal achievement. It won't be able to continue at the same rate under a Labour government with minimum wages and social chances. That is very important for people. Education is also very important for people. The lady there who spoke at the end referred to opportunities to go to university those opportunities have been vastly increased under this government, so that one in three 
students can now go on to university, we have to make sure we get our message across so that people give us the credit But for the that. problem is, Mr. Haig, that people want to know, these four people want to know, they know all about your policies, you've been telling us about them for a long time, but they want to hear from you something new that you're going to put in that manifesto, something new you agreed on today that will make them feel it really is worth making the, the, the move that they're not yet prepared to move, they're still floating, to vote Conservative. Yeah, well, we will be announcing some new measures over the coming weeks and months, and we had a discussion at Chequers today about a variety of areas, about jobs again, about housing, about social security, uh, about transport, yeah, yeah, about yeah. education. Well, and give us a hint on education. Give us a hint of what new you'll be <laughs> saying. <laughs> no, of course, we will announce our new proposals when they've been finalised. Well, let me put one to you. Let me put questions on television. Let me put one particular one to you, because there has been a lot of speculation that you propose effectively to scrap local education authorities oh, and to have no. schools completely independent of local authorities. You will have to wait for the manifesto or other announcements to see what we're proposing in the election. But people can clearly see from our education policies uh, to date, and we were talking about them a little earlier, the themes in which we believe of expanding choice, uh, of greater parental involvement in education, of raising standards through regular testing, through implementing the national curriculum, all things, by the way, which the opposition parties opposed when they were going through. Uh, and all of those things are now raising standards in British education. We want to continue with those themes, and we'll have some new measures to help them along. OK, Mr Haig, thank you very much for joining us. Now, church leaders, police and politicians in Northern Ireland all agree that the level of sectarianism has risen to unprecedented and dangerous levels. Wounds from Drum Cree last year are still raw, while people are already gearing up for this year's marching season. Today, the Northern Ireland Secretary told Newsnight that comparisons with the rising tension in Germany in the 30s were not too far-fetched. Indeed, so concerned is the government that it's planning a new advertising campaign against sectarianism. From Northern Ireland, Martha Carney reports. They're not selling toys or baby food. This ad shoot is about hatred. During the IRA ceasefire, Northern Ireland TV viewers watched these children promote a message of peace in a government campaign. And turn over. Now the future is much more uncertain. The ad takes on a more sinister air as macabre toys appear and news of sectarian attacks is played in the background. We show that because there's a radio playing. Um, as they play, and the radio is carrying uh, a representation of the news of the last uh, six, nine months. And that radio is used as a device um, to surprise our audience with where we're going to. It's, it's very depressing, and, and because, you know, there were so many new ideas that we were experimenting with and exploring about, about how we can build a more tolerant attitude, attitude here, and now we're having to return to images of, of the downside side of life here so but but it's depressing but this job has to be done in his constituency this weekend the northern ireland secretary told me that the ad campaign was vital because the wounds of last year's marching season were still raw and sectarianism was growing worse since the events of last summer people's attitudes have hardened they have polarized we're on a sharp downturn at the moment i don't think anybody is served by trying to conceal that but I do think that by recognizing it, there are the seeds of uh, an improvement, because there's no doubt that after Drum Cree and the events that surrounded it and Londonderry the following month last year, people were horrified at what they'd seen. It's an old cliche to say they'd looked into the abyss, but it's a pretty apt one, and they didn't like what they saw. What they've seen since the ceasefires were called has been a dramatic increase in sectarian attacks. Over the past two years, more than 70 orange halls have been burnt, more than 100 churches. One Catholic chapel in Ballymena has been picketed by loyalists every Saturday for the past 20 weeks. A priest there drew a comparison with the anti-Semitic attacks on Kristallnacht under the Nazis. <laughs> Controversially, that theme could be developed by the Northern Ireland office in its new anti-sectarian campaign. An idea being actively pursued for the next ad draws on historic parallels with Nazi Germany. 
I think you'd be looking to the years just before the Second World War in Germany when everybody knows it's on the public record that it was certainly state-sponsored, but that sectarianism really was having a, a field day there, of Jewish businesses being closed, and boycotted, uh, synagogues being burnt, um, unpopular authors going on the bonfires, um, pretty horrendous stuff. I, I don't know whether there's a direct parallel or not. Some people would say there is. I guess other people would, would say it isn't. It couldn't happen here. But I think it's probably worth considering that as an idea. I understand that one of the ideas in development is looking at parallels with other countries, one in particular at looking at church burnings in Northern Ireland and comparing them with pre-war Germany. Well, I think that that is a valid comparison to make. Some people will say, oh, it's shocking, oh, it's alarmist, it's extremist. We haven't gone as far as that. No, we haven't gone as far as that. But I wonder how many people have in their minds the unspoken word, yet. Some thought that point had been reached in Drum Cree last summer, when old enmities erupted as strongly as ever before. It was as if there'd never been a ceasefire. In that tense week, there was an outpouring of emotion, echoes of which are still being felt. Then there were blockades. Now there's a boycott of some Protestant businesses by Catholic customers. We spoke to one trader in a sharply divided town. Too scared to appear on camera, he fears he'll go out of business, as others have done. We got a letter from a concerned customer that we were blamed for being out on the roadblocks due to the Zumkree thing, which was uh, not true when we weren't at Drumcree. I had no interest in Drumcree for the simple reason I'm not an orange man. I'm not in any political party. It looks to me as if it's purely religion. Some of the people that have boycotted me were personal friends. And I'm just at a loss to know why it has happened to us. Must be because we were Protestants or were being targeted. I just don't understand it. The threat to me is very serious. I just feel I, I, I didn't want to do this, but I felt in my heart that I had to do it because I feel that isolated. I feel that stated that nobody's listening to me. I'm hurting. I'm hurting bad. Saturday afternoon in Catholic North Belfast. There's excitement before today's big match. Cliftonville against the Ballyclare Comrades. But there's more to fear in an away game for Cliftonville supporters than just their team being beaten. Setting out from the ground called Solitude, they're isolated in a largely Protestant league. Here too lies the legacy of Drum Cree. The bus has been attacked so often, they joke about a golden brick award for the most windows smashed. Last October, a loyalist mob overwhelmed the Cliftonville fans. The first thing we seen was uh, a lot of people holding up placards, Republican scum that walk in the middle of there. And then the windows started coming in. And uh, the police were totally overwhelmed. They weren't, just weren't ready for it. Well, it was about five or six windows put in our bus and the kids, there was a lot of kids in the bus and they were going to start screaming. Oh, well, wouldn't they get out again? Seventy one. We were perceived as being Catholics coming into their area. To them, it must seem like an obvious way of retaliating or something. I don't know. If, if we're perceived as being a, an easy target or a way of getting revenge for, for sort of retaliating for things which have nothing to do with us, then uh, you know, if we're an easy target for getting back at the national, what's perceived to be the national community, well, people will do that regardless of what we do. That's the biggest worry that it's out of our hands. It's got so bad that many supporters feel they'll have to leave the league, part of the trend of Catholics and Protestants leading increasingly separate lives throughout Northern Ireland. Sectarianism isn't simply about burning churches or orange halls. In some parts of the countryside, there's always been a boycott. You simply wouldn't go into a shop belonging to the other side. 
in Belfast, you've got the solid bricks of the peace walls. In rural areas, there's what one author has called the glass curtain. New research reveals just how strong that glass curtain can be. Invisible barriers between two villages in South Armagh. One Protestant, Glenan, the other Catholic, White Cross. Just a mile apart, but in separate worlds. Researchers from the University of Ulster found that villagers mixed largely with their own religion. Relatively few visited the other village, and even shopping was on religious lines. In White Cross, people go south to mainly Catholic Newry. In Glenan, they go north to Market Hill. The, the way in which the, the communities live out their daily lives is interesting in terms of how little contact there is between them and how they, how they behave completely separately when it comes to daily things like shopping, going for entertainment, going out, going out to the pub at night and things like that. This segregation is understandable. It stems from fear. Glen Ann and White Cross are villages traumatised by the Troubles. In 1976, three Catholics were killed in White Cross. The next day, ten Protestants who worked at the Glen Ann factory were shot dead on a bus back from work. And six years ago, the UDR base in Glen Ann was blown up by Ireland's biggest bomb. In response, the Protestant population has declined. In Glen Ann, the shop, post office and the primary school have all closed in recent years. It's known as the greening of the border that idea of territory being lost fuels Protestant determination to march. It does strongly. I mean, tradition and territory are a strong cocktail when it comes to the community. Um, uh, per perceptions of, of loss and gain, and although it might seem quite marginal and, and almost incidental to, to a tradition, um, it's, it's, it's a vital part of, of not just their identity and heritage, but also their future and, and their ability to to feel comfortable and to feel that they have a sustainable future me means of being able to enjoy traditional rights that they had to land and to territory and, and all that's part of it. Even marching up a certain road? Oh yeah, very much so. It's all part of, all probably um, part of the, the, the same feature of territory. Just as land has been lost, some Protestants also feel their cultural identity is now under threat from the Irish tradition. They want recognition for what they regard as their own language. Ulster Scots. If I give you uh, body parts, uh, your nose would be called your neb, your ear would be called your lug, your eyes are your ain, your mouth is your gab, your throat is your thrapple. It's, that would be the sort of body parts. Uh, greetings would be farfaya, uh, with we gang you. Know, my position uh, is information stroke community outreach officer of the Ulster Scots Heritage Council. Uh, in Ulster Scots, I'd say I'm the camper of the Ulster Scots Hairscape Council. You know, it's, 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 it's a Unfortunately, it's a language which has not been schooled for centuries. It's not just a folk revival. There's a political dimension to this. Here in Grey Abbey, the Unionist Council has helpfully translated street signs into Ulster Scots as a defence of Ulster Protestants against ill-guided attempts to make them Irish. I don't feel myself to be Irish in any way whatsoever. I'm neither Irish by choice, by nature, by name, or anything else. It doesn't appeal to me. It's not where I come from. My ancestors come from the Scotch Presbyterians in the lowlands of Scotland. And then the fact of the matter is, that's where the majority of us come from. During the peace process, essentially there was a move towards uh, an emphasis on common Irishness. Emphasising similarities is often papering over the cracks. I mean, it's like there's been a great analysis of the various musics that are played in uh, Ulster and s pointing the common origins of the music. I mean, that completely misses out what the messages of the words say. You know, they're playing the same instrument, maybe using the same notes, but the messages which are being transmitted are very, very different, and it's the different messages which are the problem. That separatist ethos is shared by Orangemen preparing for this year's drum cree. Joel Patton, a leading light of the protests, claims his garden business has been boycotted since. Ominously, he says his grassroots campaign doesn't regard Drum Cree last year as a victory. A victory is when you don't have to fight the battle again. Um, what happened to Drum Cree has to be done this year and again and again every year because this is an ongoing thing for Protestants and that Drum Cree in many ways is their Alamo. It's where they have drawn a line in the sand and said, look, we, we cannot give in to this, we cannot concede one more thing. And even though there is a great reticence among the Protestant people to face another drum cree this year, and even a fear, uh, they're left with no other alternative but, but to take a stand again this year.
While staking out territory is crucial for some, for the victims of last year's bitterness, the price has already been too high. I would say that this time next year I will be there and have to sell up. And I started up 25 years ago. I had nothing, but I worked very hard 25 years, my wife and my family, and at the end of 25 years, just for back to where I was. With attention already focused on this year's marching season, Northern Ireland could end up an even more segregated society. I think it's 20 mile out of time before someone seriously does get hurt on a bus. Maybe a, a window being smashed or someone being blind or someone being killed. And no football matches worth that there. And I think if things do get out of hand, like a start this summer, this is only my opinion, I think they must seriously look somewhere else to play football because it's not worth it. Someone's going to get hurt. For the moment, why has Michael Grade suddenly resigned as the head of Channel 4? But first, a brief look at today's other main stories. The Truth Commission in South Africa, the body which looks into human rights abuses in the apartheid era, has confirmed that it's had approaches from lawyers acting for a number of people implicated in the killing of Steve Biko. Black consciousness activist died in police custody in 1977. The commission said preliminary inquiries had been made about an amnesty. Well, I'm joined now on the phone from South Africa by the journalist who broke the story this afternoon, Lawrence Schoolman. What do you think will happen tomorrow? At this press conference, they expect that uh, the names of the five uh, security policemen who will be seeking amnesty for uh, the involvement in the death of Steve Biko will be confirmed and announced to, to the public. What sort of men are these people? They're all former security policemen. Uh, all five of them, and all five of them have since retired from police service. And what do you think will be the significance of people admitting that they murdered Steve Biko? The family of Biko and of, you know, the people in other cases have always asked that the people involved in the deaths and disappearance of these people should come forward and say what has happened, and in that sense you know, clear their conscience and let the people can know what happened and, and to Mr. their family. Right, and Mr. Scoobin, what would be the deal that they'd be after then exactly? What precisely would be the deal they'd be after? Well, the amnesty will, you know, if, if they get amnesty, it will mean that they won't have to go to jail and they will be pardoned for what they've done. And with one of them already facing a 20-year jail sentence for something else that he's been convicted of, he'll be seeking for amnesty for that as well. If they don't but get the amnesty offer, will they come forward? The, the, if they don't get the amnesty, they will probably be prosecuted in, in court. And okay. Okay, thank you very much. We must end there. Thank you, Mr. Truman, for joining us very much. The police are to review their files on the missing Whitemore prison officer, Peter Curran, after suggestions that his disappearance may be linked to the breakout there. Mr. Curran went missing six months after the attempted escape by five IRA prisoners and an armed robber. Ford has agreed to change its recruitment policy after the company was taken to an industrial tribunal accused of racial discrimination. Seven black and Asian production workers, backed by the Transport Workers Union, claimed they'd been prevented from getting jobs as long-distance lorry drivers. The Lord Chief Justice Lord Bingham has strongly criticised government proposals in the Crime Bill for mandatory sentences on some persistent defenders. offenders. Lord Bingham told peers that the bill was unjust and wouldn't work. And the markets, the 100 share index closed 7 points down at 42.12. While in New York, the Dow Jones fell 36 points to 66.61. The pound rose in London by almost two pfennigs to close at two marks, 66.2. And on Wall Street, the pound dropped half a cent to $1.62.2. The boss of Channel 4 television, Michael Grade, surprised his staff and the broadcasting world by announcing his resignation this evening and refusing to explain why. One of broadcasting's most experienced executives has simply indicated that he's moving into new, non-media pastures. But his timing could be awkward for Channel 4, with the government still considering whether to privatise the channel, and the rival Channel 5 about to launch. Shock at Channel 4 tonight at the sudden departure of the man who's championed his channel through privatisation battles, boosted ratings and advertising revenue. He's agreed to pay back more than £100,000 of his half a million a year salary to buy himself out. Oh, I don't really want to say anything for a while till, uh, till I'm uh, able to talk about the future.
which will be shortly, but not tonight. Thanks a lot. Is it true you'll be joining the PA? Michael Grady is able to go now because I think he has finally sort of seen off the last threat facing Channel 4, uh, which is privatisation, which was talked about as a possible promise in the Tory uh, election manifesto. I, I can't perceive that he would be leaving the Channel now so close to a general election if that threat still existed. A journalist by training, Michael Grade's television career began at ITV, at London Weekend Television. Then he crossed the Atlantic, spending three not hugely successful years in Hollywood. He returned unexpectedly in 1984 to become controller of BBC One. And he then went to Channel 4 eight years ago. He's a leader, really, and uh, I think uh, that combination of his creative skills in, in, in drawing talent in and also his persistence in ensuring that he put uh, Channel 4 on the broadcasting map, not just in its, uh, in its first instance, but in, actually in, in ensuring that it's there for the future, has been very critical. But he was criticised for allowing executives to take Channel 4, as it was put, down market. And a string of provocative programmes got him dubbed Pornographer-in-Chief. Some of the campaigns uh, which have been run against uh, Michael have been quite outrageous and unjustified. And I think it's a tribute to his very broad shoulders that he's been able to do his job and do it successfully and well, despite a great deal uh, of antagonising from certain sections of the press. So with her now for one of television's most outspoken characters. Whether he's now off to take a role in the new flowering of Britain's film industry, or to take his fascination with soccer to the job of running the Premier League, is tonight a matter of intense speculation. Well now, Anthony Carl's media correspondent for Guardian, what do you think? Why do you think he left? Well, Peter, I think he thinks that Channel 4's um, future is secure. I think he thinks he's seen off the threat of privatisation. He's also got Channel 4's money back that it was paying to ITV every year. This year will be the last year they do that. And I think he thought perhaps the time is now right to face up to a new challenge. I'm sure he's had a very lucrative offer from someone, and I think he will be telling us in the next few days what that is, but it's just guesswork tonight. Andrew, I'm sorry I called you Anthony earlier. Um, the Daily Telegraph tomorrow morning saying Grade could face a £1 million bill. That's another question as he quits Channel 4 for breaking his contract, for ending his contract. They uh, speculate he might be joining uh, the distribution arm of Rank Films. Do you think it's the entertainment industry or could it be something quite different? There are, there are two rumours uh, doing the rounds tonight. One is um, the, the idea that he might be joining Rank. The other is that he could become the chief executive of the, um, of the Premier League and he has interests in both those areas. He's remaining very tight-lipped about it. As I understand it, he's being very cautious. He wants to sign on the dotted line and make the announcement in his own good time and that's why he's being uncharacteristically silent about now, it tonight. How vulnerable do you think Channel 4 will be, in view of all the uh, question marks that hang over it, uh, without grade? Well it's clear the staff have been taken aback tonight. They heard when the, when the board meeting broke up at about 6.30, they'd assumed it was a routine meeting. Um, they were stunned, they were flabbergasted. Um, one of them told me it was like a bolt out of the blue. Um, they're very worried about the future because Michael Grade has been the public face of the channel. He's defended it from the attacks of uh, privatisation. He's also uh, defended it when people have suggested that it's been abandoning its, abandoning its uh, minority programming remit. So Is Matt Baker, by the way, right to say that he thinks the privatisation threat's gone away? I think so. I, it certainly, it, it wasn't in the November budget. We don't expect it to be in the Tory election manifesto, and Labour have said there's no way they will privatise But then what about the, threat, the, the, the competition threat from Channel 5? Channel 5 is a threat for all terrestrial broadcasters, but it may be more of a problem for um, ITV and BBC One than for Channel 4. Do you want to guess, uh, guess who might be his successor? Lots of names in the frame tonight. Alan Yensop, the director of programmes at BBC, has been mentioned. Liz Forgan, who used to be at Channel 4 and also used to be at the BBC. Um, those are names which are possibly in the frame. What everybody would be asking, of course, about Channel 4 now is, in the light of the fact that many people thought that uh, Michael Gray himself was leading the channel down market, will the successor, his successor, be able to or want to go on with that sort of trend or try and mark out Channel 4, particularly in view of all the multiplicity of things that are happening in television, as that kind of different type of television? I think um, people will be very keen to try and pursue the same policy that Michael Grade has pursued. Channel 4 has been remarkably successful in establishing itself as both a minority channel, but also one that, uh, in its comedy and its, and its support of the British film industry, has marked out a distinctive um, part of the market. And I think a successor will want to build on what Michael Grade has achieved, not take it away. Andrew, thank you very much. And the Express's verdict on the departure of Michael Grade is exit the king of trash TV. Uh, tomorrow morning's Daily Mail, Grade quits Channel 4, one of the most controversial figures in television. The Times says Commons uh, defeat hits Mr Major's hope of uh, having a general election on May the 1st. 
Uh, same thing in the Financial Times, an embarrassing setback after the Cabinet agreed his election manifesto. Uh, Tories to fight for the flag and the wallet, says the Independent. Uh, and the Guardian's a rather different story, suggesting there was a secret plan by the government to sell off the inland revenue. That's all from Newsnight tonight. Jeremy's back with more tomorrow night. Till then, from all of us on the programme, good night. <laughs>